Dr. Deborah Lyles is Assistant Professor of History at, and W.K. Gordon Chair of Texas History at Tarleton State University. She is the author of several book chapters and journal articles and co-editor of three books, African Americans in Central Texas, From Slavery to Civil Rights, Texas Women and Ranching, On the Range, at the Rodeo and in Their Communities, and Women in Civil War Texas, Diversity and Dissidents in the Trans-Mississippi, which won the Otis Locke Award for Best Book of the Year and Liz Carpenter Award for Best Book on Women's History. Her current projects are Southern Roots, Western Foundations, Slavery and Livestock in Texas, and Oliver Loving, Dean of the Cattle Trails. Dr. Lyles will be talking about Texas cattle, Texas railroads, and the closing of the frontier. Please welcome her. Uh-uh, I'm not good with that. Okay, so forward, reverse, lay there. And don't hit that one. Forward? No. Forward is the green button. Forward is the green button. Where's the mm -hmm. laser, this one? Forward, uh, okay. laser. Laser. <laughs> laser. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, staying for the kiss of death session, the last one at the end of the night. Um, I appreciate that very much. Uh, a brief disclaimer, I'm recovering from a concussion, so if I at any time blank over, we're going to blame that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, before I get started, I need to tell you a little bit about how I conduct my research. Um, unlike a lot of people, I have a tendency to bury myself in tax records, um, and I spent three years transcribing property tax records, um, primarily from what would be the northwestern frontier before the Civil War. Um, I always <laughs> tell people that this is also um, when I started drinking. Um, <laughs> But there you go. Um, so uh, please forgive me for the few slides that have a lot of figures in them. I don't expect you to ingest any of these or be as excited about them as I am. Um, I will try to point out the highlights and try to give you some sense of, of why they're important. So uh, let me get started. So we've all seen this slide. We've all seen this picture. Um, what we didn't see uh, were these numbers right here. Uh, this is a four to one ratio of uh, livestock to people, and this is a 22 to one uh, ratio of livestock to people. This map is basically from uh, an 1830 number, um, and it basically it addresses the fact that people from the lower south are moving to this area where they are raising cash crops, primarily, of course, cotton. Um, and people from the upper south are moving into this portion of Texas where they're concentrating on livestock. And what they're doing, just like Louisiana served as the breadbasket um, for the Caribbean, uh, you'll see that this region of Texas will serve as the breadbasket for the Lower South, primarily because that land will be dedicated to raising cash crops, right? So these guys are going to raise livestock. These guys are going to primarily raise cash crops. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the two don't cross boundaries at some point, um, but what it does mean is that that's the norm. Um, you will also see, if you take a, a, a listing of how many slaves reside in each area, reside is a loose word, of course, um, the majority of the slaves in Texas are going to be in east and southern Texas, and the small numbers of slaves will be in this area and coming down the frontier. Um, and there's a direct correlation in that. Small slave owners raise livestock primarily. And these are the guys that have been overlooked um, throughout our history of the state and throughout the history of primarily in, in the South. So just as Target was talking about earlier, where he was talking about the, the little newspaper snippet that would then get broadcast all the way over the United States, this one is from December the 8th, 19, 1849. Um, and it, it's about John Dunman, who will actually live in the, in the southern portion of the state. Uh-oh. Already. I don't know how to go back. Back. Um, he lives down here on the San Jacinto River. Um, so his trade is primarily going to be with New Orleans, um, which will feed then the, the southern, the livestock, um, the south primarily, right, with providing the livestock to those people that are raising cash crops. Um, and basically what this is telling you, and it's trying to advertise the um, ability to raise livestock in Texas, is within a 12-year period, John Dunman, who was incidentally a small slave owner, um, has taken his herd of 33 head of cattle, and, and the increase has come up to 3,000 within that 12-year period. And they challenge anybody to, to beat this. <laughs> 
So this would have been enough, obviously, to go ahead and keep feeding the south and to keep the cattlemen um, in good standing. But what will happen um, in 1848 is that we'll discover gold in California. I mean, with this, what we'll start seeing is a shift in the market for livestock. Um, and, and the main reason for that, of course, goes back to basic economics, right? Supply and demand. And there will be a demand in California. Originally, um, California would make its living, um, or people in California would make their living skinning livestock, um, leaving them on the, on the side, on the land to rot, and then they would sell their hides. There was no value in the meat. When the gold rush comes along, and the, the great transfer of people that will go across the continent, of course they will need that meat, um, and they will quickly work their way or eat their way through those animals, um, and then there will be a big demand. Well, it just so happens that here in Texas, we had an abundance of livestock, um, and so we're gonna capitalize on that. And what we're gonna see is that uh, here in Texas, livestock is free, if you go round it up yourself, or it's approximately six to eight dollars if you buy it from a local person. Um, and people will either move down here and get livestock, or they will transfer livestock, which is also in abundance. This is what I call a livestock frontier. Um, and they will take this livestock, and then they will go down the southern route, and they will sell it in Sacramento, California, for $100 to $150 a piece, depending on what the market bore. And of course, a lot of times they're getting gold for this, not useless money. Um, they're, they're getting paid in gold. And so, I think this is where my tax records come in. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Property tax records will record anything of value, right? Um, there's a uniformity clause which basically says anything that's taxable will get taxed um, the same amount all the way through. Um, and so usually there's slaves, land, anything of value like a gold watch or anything else. Of course, what I'm interested in primarily is the horses, cattle, and the sheep, which were not recorded until 1860, um, and then the slaves, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Uh, 1853, in most of these tax records, uh, for the counties that existed in 1853, you'll start seeing a jump. It's just a discrete jump. So you'll start noticing the numbers either double or triple or, or make a marks at some point. Um, you can see from the beginning in Denton County, which is in North Texas, um, there, was none, there were none, no horses recorded in 1846. The cattle numbers were very small. And look what happens within the space of, of this, well, math's not my strong suit, however many years that is. Um, you can see the value, and this is $7.4 uh, $7 million, uh, basically. This is not a worthless trade, right, is my point. We always talk about the, the fact that the cattle industry and the livestock industry had no, had no value until after the war, which is when the cattle drive started. Um, my argument here is that it had a lot of value, and a lot of people were making a lot of money uh, during this antebellum period raising and selling livestock. And you can see this easily in the census records. And incidentally, if you load this in with all the little icons in your PowerPoint, it will lock up and it will shut your system down completely. <laughs> <clears throat> so I highly recommend taking a picture. Um, but you can see, in, in, this is in Erath County. Yeah, this is Erath County, which is notably out on the frontier. I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, and everybody in the county basically is associated except the, the preacher, who's uh, defined by the steps because they're walking at this point, the teacher and the sheriff, who is also probably in one way or another connected to the livestock industry, right? Um, you can see the movement. And, and the, the trick with the census records is that a lot of people who actually wrote down um, or they, they defined what people did for an occupation um, is that they often substituted the word farmer for stock raisers. And so we have a drastic undercount of what people did um, during this time period. And if you actually go look at their tax records, a lot of the times they don't even have any land, but they do have a lot of livestock, and yet they're identified as farmers. Um, we need to really be cognizant of this fact that they're misidentified in a lot of the census records. Um, and make sure you double check those uh, tax records and have all that fun, it's great. So going back to the, the topic of slavery, um, we primarily associate slavery and the benefits of slaves um, with, with having a cash crop product. Um, I will argue 
all day long that the value of a slave to somebody that was raising livestock was at least equally as valuable. Um, I would actually argue that it's much more profitable to have a slave in the livestock industry than it is in um, a cash crop economy. So this is 1860, an 1860 map. I'm actually going to go back it a little bit in a minute. And of course, this is not the actual map. This is just the map that Texas wants you to think exists at this time. Um, you'll notice that now we have absolutely no presence of Indians unless you want to look up here into Indian territory. Uh, there are no locations. Uh, like Dr. Barr pointed out in the, middle, in the beginning, uh, we've completely moved the Indians off the map. Um, and this is where, basically down the 100th, is where we define Texas, and then of course out here um, to El Paso. Re in reality, the map looks a little bit more like this, right? Um, these are your frontier counties that are, that are uh, not populated very much, um, and this area is just, just hope at this point. They, they think they will get it, and at some point, they're not sure when, um, but they have it designated. So we already talked about Denton County. That was the first um, county. And Erath County is right there where everybody was identifying as a stock raiser. I want to go ahead and, uh, yeah, more figures. So here's Lavaca, and this is your test to see if everybody's listening. What does Lavaca mean? The cow, right? The, no hints on what's going on in this county whatsoever, right? Um, again, here's our 1853, and we'll start seeing a rise in, in, in some of the figures. Um, you can see in 1849 the amount of land, the slaves, the horses, and cattle, and you can see the growth. Um, Lavaca actually does, uh, is primarily livestock um, down to this point right here, and then it will start uh, giving out more land and start producing um, corn, which is also another crop that goes with uh, farmers that are people that raise stock. Um, when, when they're not tending the cattle, they're basically raising crops like wheat and corn, um, which is also another one of those, uh, those are the other crops that get overlooked a lot in the southern history. Um, corn is, is one of the largest crops, if not the largest crop in the south. We just don't ever think about it. It provides food, not just for people, but obviously to animals. And if you're raising the corn, you're going to want to make sure that your animals are fed throughout the year. Travis County, where we are now, where we don't ever think about Austin being anything other than a uh, big city, didn't raise any uh, cotton at all. It was corn and it was livestock. And again, you can see the rise in the number of slaves um, through that brief period of 12 years. Um, and you can also see the number of uh, horses and cattle. And again, here we go in 1860. They didn't just start with 4,443 uh, head of, of um, sheep at that time. They had been doing them. They just didn't count them until 1860. It wasn't required. So what does all this mean? <clears throat> Here's Parker County. And Parker County did not exist in 1853, so we can't even look at that. But what I, I, what I really want you to sh see with all these numbers is that there was always the smallest portion of these uh, counties that were occupied by slave owners. Um, and when I, these were just a small portion of the taxpayers. And when you take these numbers and you look at what portion of the population were slave owners, which is right here, and you look at the other people that are raising cattle and you think, well, they're doing really well too because it's an equal opportunity um, adventure, right, raising cattle. But then you start looking at how much they own versus their portion of the population and you can see automatically that the benefit of having slaves comes back to this, this portion of the declared um, property in the county, right? They own more livestock, they own uh, more land, and they own more property in general than the other portion of the population that doesn't own slaves. So just like in counties where they're raising cash crops and the slave owners who have large numbers of slaves are benefiting from those large numbers, the stockmen are benefiting equally from small numbers of slaves. And this is where it starts to get interesting. The people that we think of as the people who uh, become the cattlemen that we talk about in school, Oliver Loving being one that I'm writing about right now, uh, John Simpson Chisholm, who will own an, an enormous portion of New Mexico, C.C. Slaughter, John Hunter Herndon was the richest man in Texas in 1860. 
Um, his wife um, had uh, inherited some rice plantations uh, by this point, um, but his stock was largely tied up in Arabian horses, of all things. Um, he had, the, so here he is, the richest man in Texas, is a livestock trader. Daniel Wagner, the Wagner Ranch. Um, George West, George West, Texas. Um, these guys are all slave owners, small slave owners, um, and they all um, benefited after the war because of the labor given to them, or not given to them, the, because of the labor taken um, to help build their enterprises and the livestock industry beforehand. And we mustn't forget the women. So Margaret Borland and Elizabeth Fitzpatrick are two of those women. I'll talk about Margaret Borland in just a second. Elizabeth Fitzpatrick, if anybody uh, knows anything about Indian raids on the frontier, um, Elizabeth P Fitzpatrick, home, her, her home was uh, raided in 1864 uh, at the tail end of the Civil War. And it's always put out as, as the uh, atrocities of the Indians coming in and, and uh, a savage attack. If you actually look through the tax records, um, and you match up all the Indian attacks that actually occurred down the frontier um, during the Civil War and after, you'll see that they're not coming in and just raiding these frontiers. They're coming in and uh, taking the cattle, right? And, and you can argue all day long whose cattle it was, but if it's feral and it's in Comanche uh, territory, I would say that it belongs to the Comanches. which doesn't make me very popular. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about the women for just a second. Um, women are, and excuse my highlighting that doesn't even line up, um, women are always overlooked in this livestock uh, story also, um, and, and they shouldn't be. They're harder to find for multiple reasons. Um, usually their wealth is attributed to their husbands. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, or what happens when you get married? Their name changes, and you often disappear from uh, census records, um, or you, your nothing is attributed to you, or uh, your name changes in the tax records, and so people don't think to trace that name change, or your property is not declared in the tax records because now your husband is either going to take it and declare it or not declare it, as the case may be. So it's harder to track the women in the livestock industry, but they were definitely there. Uh, Margaret Brown at this point is actually, Margaret Brown right here is listed as a stock raiser, um, but when you look in the tax records, you can't find her. It turns out that she was actually Margaret Barksdale in the tax records because the, uh, the six-month period um, in the difference in the, the reporting in the census records and the tax records, uh, she got married. Right, um, and so her name doesn't show up as one. But if you look at her, her uh, declaration, she had 18 horses worth $540 and 2,000 head of cattle, or 2,000 head of cattle worth $12,000. Uh, this would be in 1860, um, and I would, when you think about the fact that a Confederate soldier got paid $12 a month, um, this is a lot of money. Right, uh, the same here. I have no idea why I have her on there. We'll blame the concussion. Uh, <laughs> Martha Loring, right here, is one of those stories I like, and I explored that a little further. Um, the story goes with Martha Loring that they moved from one county to the other because he wanted to set, he wanted to pursue the livestock industry. When you actually look at his tax records, he has no livestock whatsoever except for a few racehorses which leads to the gambling, which leads to the drinking, which led to the death of a slave when the ax accidentally left his one arm and hit uh, Martha Loring's skull. And um, when he was whipping the slave for not uh, cutting firewood fast enough, Martha Loring will then start declaring the cattle, and you start thinking, well, maybe she just inherited it, and he set her up really well. But when you start going through all the records, um, you realize that he was actually declaring her cattle, um, and you start going through all the papers, the probate papers, you start realizing that not only did she, was she declaring it here, but through the next two marriages, um, we'd also ha you also have to follow where that livestock goes. Um, at some point during the tax records, uh, that the person recording her to pay her taxes makes a mistake and records her as Martha A. Martha, um, which, again, this is another reason we have so much trouble tracing these women in this history, right? Um, I also want to point out that this was an equal opportunity, not just for women, but for women of color. 
which we didn't have a lot of free people in Texas um, before the war. Um, but Harriet Reynolds was a livestock raiser. She's a mulatta. Um, and then we have several other women, including, including Ann Rose, who was 58 years old and had uh, $3,800 worth of livestock in a time when uh, free blacks are going to have a tremendous amount of trouble trying to make a living, much less a woman trying to make a living. Um, this is an amazing opportunity for them that they take advantage of, as they well should. Uh, back to back to Miss Borland. Um, Alexandra Borland is always given credit. TSHA is guilty of this one, and I love TSHA, but um, TSHA, the handbook online, mentions that Alexandra Borland was a rich rancher who married a poor widow. Um, indeed, she was a widow, but she was not poor. Uh, her taxes show her right here with 1500 a head of livestock uh, worth $7,500, and where the tax records show him it's not having a dime. <laughs> Not a dime, right? Um, and and again, here you go. These are the census records for this year, and this kind of comes back to that whole idea that he was farming. When actually he's not farming, he's raising cattle, and he's not raising his cattle. He's raising her cattle. But he gets the credit. And what is she doing? I guess she's eating bonbons because she's she's got no credit for anything, right? Although this is his property. So anyway, maps. Back to maps. <laughs> so this is um, this is a trail of William Bellinger. William Bellinger is a rare commodity um, in the antebellum years. He actually left as a journal um, from an 1850 cattle drive or 1858 cattle drive, where uh, he left Gonzales County and went up um, to Chicago to take stock. He wasn't taking his own stock. He was part of a cattle drive, um, and they went ahead and went up and. Um, I started reading it and I thought, well, I can Google plot this. This will be fun. And, and sure enough, it was fun. Well, it's my kind of fun um, <laughs> with a glass of wine. And so uh, you can see where they go up and where they camp out. And when he gets all the way to Illinois, uh, gets into Chicago, he actually catches a train and then he goes across and he gets to New York and he goes all the way around and he comes back here to Gonzales County and he'll make the trip again later. Now, there are accounts where people say this trip wasn't worthy. Are you going to go all the way up here if it's not worthy? Twice? The first time? What is that? Shame on you, right? They're making plenty of money. Don't let them fool you. Um, this is also uh, the trail of the Shawnee Trail that went, uh, came into Texas before and the, and the Texas Road where a lot of the, traveler, the travelers would come into Texas. Um, his route will follow the Shawnee Trail. This is not the same trail that everybody will take. Olive Loving will actually leave here or Olive Loving Son will leave here um, in 1857 and he will skirt across here primarily to avoid those quarantine laws from the, the tick fever. Um, he will come up this way. But either way, they're headed right here into Illinois, which will then, in turn, raise livestock um, that will be fed east. So here we are in uh, the antebellum years. Um, and these are just a few of those places that we talk about that actually are dealing with uh, Texas cattle, right? Um, this doesn't look like a whole lot of no business to me. Um, you're not only going to California and feeding the Western markets, um, you're going back down into Mexico, which I would argue is actually the first uh, cattle drive because these guys are feeding Mexico before they go feed the troops in 1779. Um, this cattle is also going to all points in Louisiana. Um, 1850, 1859, we get the gold rush in, Cal in Colorado, excuse me, um, and we will, including Olive Loving, will go up here and feed these markets. Um, and of course, in Indian Territory, we're selling here and all the way up here. Come the time for the Civil War, um, you'll start seeing the difference in where we're selling, but we are selling, make no mistake. And just as an added bonus, if you're in the livestock industry, you become exempt from service um, in the Confederate Army. Um, and so you can stay home on the frontier and raise your cattle and increase your holdings, um, increase your worth, and by the time the Civil War is over, these cattlemen are incredibly rich. Um, they, war makes money, right, for everybody, especially if you're supplying, um, and, and that's what these do. And we talk about the frontier receding uh, during the Civil War years, and what I find interesting 
is basically these are the line of frontier ma of f frontier forts that they're supplying. Um, and when you look at the people that are actually deserting the counties, these are the people that have nothing to do with livestock. If it was that dangerous or if there was no money to be made, these cattlemen would not stay in these frontier counties, but they do. So back to our maps. So 1860, um, you can see, and I'm sure you've seen the railroad map of, uh, of the United States before. And, and I'm sure you've discussed the fact that the South was woefully underdeveloped as far as the, uh, as far as the railroads are concerned. Um, by 1870, we're not a whole lot further ahead, um, although the North is making progress. And this, of course, will feed into those post-war cattle drives um, that will take those uh, cows to markets further east and west um, and also to the north um, as they go into Montana um, and they feed the Montana gold rush that started in, in 1864 um, and other places further north from there. Um, these guys are on the trail for months. Um, this notion that this is a romantic endeavor is hogwash. Um, they were stinking. <laughs> they uh, they were moody. They had money in their pockets when they got to their destination, but usually not on the way back because they'd spent it all. Um, there were usually 12 to 15 men, um, and they would trail approximately 2,500 head across um, to the different railheads, as you well know. Um, as the train railheads have come through, these guys are going to run uh, cattle up to those different railheads. And from there, that cattle will be taken primarily east. Um, 1866, we have approximately 260,000 that will leave Texas. By the time it's all over in 1885, we've got an estimated 20 million that will go up the trails. Um, yes, this is far more than what went up the trails in the antebellum years, but I would argue that if you took the population and the number of cattle that were actually um, claimed and under control at some point and compared them to the post-war drives, I would think that you would see some kind of correlation in that. That's a future project, um, hopefully. Um, also, there's a, there's a new book out there that mentions the fact that uh, the New York markets will explode. Now, those New York markets were actually um, very busy before, long before um, the war began. Um, Texas is not given any credit for the amount of livestock that will feed those New York markets after the war, um, but Illinois is. And if you stop and think about the fact that all our guys are going up to Illinois in the, in the pre-war years, you can see how Texas actually did feed the New York markets. Um, they had just been the seeding um, of, of those original markets in Illinois. And I had a really good picture, but We'll blame the concussion for that, too. Um, our slaves that were involved in the livestock industry before um, have learned a trade, right? And when slaves are freed, um, many of them find themselves still in some form of slavery um, in, in as far as sharecropping or not being able to go anywhere or uh, many other things. What you'll find in, in the stories when you look through the slave narratives as far as black cowboys goes, um, you'll see that those people who worked for cattlemen um, often either stayed with them um, or took on, got, worked for shares where they basically got a cow or so and then got the, the reproduction of that. Um, or they went up the trail. At least a third of the people that went up the trail were cowboys of color. Um, and these guys learned, especially right after the war, these guys learned how to do this um, during the time of slavery. They learned a valuable trade. Uh, their lives were much different. I'm never going to say it was kind. It was not. They were slaves. Um, but they worked in closer proximity than they did on the plantations, right? Um, they, they knew their owners. Their owners knew them. They often shared meals. Uh, some of these slaves were on horseback and had a gun. Um, they worked hand in hand. And you can see, it's often said that when you put a white woman in the mix, or any woman, I would think, um, that the tension between uh, people of color, men, um, who, people of color and, and Anglos will rise, because um, of course it's the woman's fault, right? Um, out on the trails, there were no women. 
Um, and men, these black cowboys, were paid equally in the beginning to the, to the white cowboys. And to me, that says a lot about how they were appreciated for their skills and their ability rather than paid less for the color of their skin. So closing the frontier um, will basically happen due to technology. Um, 1874, Glidden will go ahead and patent his barbed wire. Um, he can't sell it. So he hires this uh, whippersnapper salesman, uh, John Bet a Million Gates, um, and he goes to San Antonio, and right there in front of the Menger Hotel is actually a plaque that talks about how he came down there, and he made an enclosure, and they put cattle in it, and everybody thought, there's no way that's going to work. And he riled up the cattle, and the cattle couldn't get out, and everybody's like, I'll take some of that. And so barbed wire starts selling like crazy, um, and by 1876, barbed wire is up to three million pounds worth that they've, they've gone ahead and made and sold. And of course, by that time, you also have to take the technology that already existed with the windmill um, and use that to create water where there was none. Um, unfortunately, not everybody was appreciative of the, of the uh, let me go back of the barbed wire and the livestock, um, or the barbed wire and the windmill, um, but this will actually change the way ranching is done, and we will develop some large ranches and start enclosing those areas. Um, these ranchers will become very protective of their uh, locations. Um, there's a story out there about uh, the J.A. Ranch where uh, Charles Goodnight will uh, threaten people with his Winchester, right, the Winchester quarantine when people are trying to cross over the land, um, primarily because of tick fever, but uh, they will close that land off and they will get it to where a lot of people can't just open range ranch um, wherever they need to go. Of course, we have them, these fine looking people, um, who are fence cutting because they are trying to get across that land to get to different locations. There's a story, I just heard this the other day, so I might be off a little bit, um, but there's a story about a fence cutter in Jack County who got caught, um, and they caught him and they hanged him um, with barbed wire, um, which would be doubly bad, um, and then they hung him in the smokehouse and got him all good and leathered up and hung him from a post outside to warn anybody else that might think about cutting a fence. Um, I, that would do me. But anyway, along with the closing of the frontier, you'll start seeing, of course, the, the, the fact that the railroads will finally come in. Um, 1876 is when the railroads will come into Fort Worth, which is uh, coincidentally the same time that they uh, do this wonderful picture of Fort Worth. Um, by, by 1891, you can see the difference that it will make in Fort Worth itself, right? Um, it's become a thriving metropolis. And in part, it's because of the refrigerated car. Rather than having to take those cattle up north, worrying about cutting fences or doing anything else, you can now take this cattle to Fort Worth, or Cowtown, as we, we like to call it. Um, and they had a competition to, to bring people, the packing houses, uh-oh, the packing houses to Fort Worth, um, Armour and Swift, um, and no, I can't see that. Well, Armour and Swift, excuse me. Armour and Swift will come to town. It will change Cowtown. They will uh, bring in a lot of other people, and this will become a thriving metrop metropolis based on uh, the cattle industry. And today, as, as Torgit was talking about, Tor the Texas is still the number one producer of cotton. Uh, Texas is still the number one producer of livestock also. And my final slide, and I suppose the final slide of the day, is uh, the change in the map of Texas, right? We've now completely, um, this is 1900. The frontier is basically closed in Texas. Um, all those red lines uh, beside the county outlines, you're going to see the railroad lines that are coming into the state, which are now the new trails, and um, will change the way cattle um, and any other produce is sold here in Texas. Thank you. Questions? I can't see you, the light is glaring. <laughs> in your research, have you encountered any um, notes or information on the use of prison labor to build the railroads? 
I haven't, but I haven't, but that's not what I study. Now I have found um, there are some. Did you say prison labor to build the railroads? There are there are definitely records out there that do address that. Um, I can't point you to those. I would be the wrong person to ask. Unfortunately, um, I don't even know who you could ask. But um, if you give me your name and number, I will try and get back with you on that. That's an excellent comment. Uh oh. <laughs> no, uh, I, I was. Your your discussion of women reminded me of Suzanne Lebsack's work on terms of changing property laws, and that of course women are first given the rights to own property in their own married women, um, who would have been before femme couvert. But that, in fact, the, the strategy behind that switch was men trying to protect property from bankruptcy. So if they had if they declared bankruptcy, if all this property was also in their wives' names, then it would preserve that property. So I was just wondering, do, you, do women become more visible in the historical records with changing property laws in Texas? I just don't know how, I don't know the legal history of, of Texas and women's property rights here. So I was just wondering if you see a point where women do become more visible or no? I see Texas women uh, or women in Texas owning cattle all the way through from when I first start looking. There's actually an interesting story about, uh, hang on, John Robert Baylor. John Robert Baylor um, was the guy that goes into Arizona during the war and, and basically declares it for the Confederacy, but he was a Parker County resident, and his, uh, his brother was a, a declared Indian killer on the 1860 census. Um, John Robert Baylor used to have a ranch out in Stevens County, um, and he also used to work for the Indian Reservation. And he got into some trouble in the Indian Reservation at some point is dismissed. Um, and it's been stated that at some point um, they think he took some money. All this to say that uh, I stumbled across a document at some point which actually transferred his property to his wife shortly after he was dismissed, and it would be to actually protect his property from bankruptcy should he be charged. I never found where he was charged, so I don't really know what happened with the property, if she kept it or not. I never did a follow-up on that, but yeah. So it goes back and forward, I suppose. Uh, yes. Uh, did you see a transition from longhorn cattle due to the ticks to Hereford cattle uh, around the 1890s, 1910s, when the railroads were coming in uh, before the trailers and trucks uh, hauled them off? The Herefords were actually introduced before that they came in. Right. Um, in in the 60s, they would, they would start coming in. Um, my research generally goes up to 1865. Um, I stop at the end of slavery because my, my, my focus is on, is on livestock and slavery. Um, but there were several people, including Eichard's uh, brother, who would bring in the Herefords to that area beforehand. Um, the Longhorns got a bad rap, um, basically, for being stringy, but I guess it depends on how hungry you are and how valuable they are, right? It's kind of like that Florida scrub cattle. It may have not looked great for somebody that was living in the north, but when you ship that over to Cuba, uh, where there was no cattle there whatsoever, it looked like a tasty feast. Um, Longhorns obviously also had the advantage where they didn't have to be watered as much, um, so they were uh, great cattle to truck all the way over to California. Um, and and they actually face a benefit in California in 1856 because there's a drought. And even though there's a glut in the market for livestock at that point, and the, cow, the cows will start dying out, and they will start calling for more Texas cattle, which is livestock from uh, the Longhorns, right? Um, so they have benefits multiple times um, and multiple years, depending on what the need was. Um, but they will start crossing them after the war because the, they start getting rejected um, because the better quality meats come in in different places, different markets. Good afternoon, Dr. Lyles. Thank Good you for your afternoon, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your wonderful presentation. It was really insightful. Thank you. And helped to uh, help us to understand better what 
what cattle ranching and slavery looked like. I was wondering if you could just speak to a little bit, um, speak to a little bit how, how uh, enslaved cowboys changes our understanding of slavery in Texas and in the South. I think it changes the value of everything, right? We always focus on the large slave owners. Um, we, we seldom look at the, the story usually goes that, you know, the small slave owners were just hoping to grow up as large slave owners eventually, um, and that uh, a few slaves never really benefited anybody. Um, I'll, I'd also like to address the fact that on the frontier counties, you'll see that there were more female slaves than male slaves, which is something people don't generally associate with uh, frontier areas. They always it's always projected that you have to clear the land, and so you need strong um, male slaves to do this. Um, that's actually not true. Um, if you think about the geography of Texas and you think about the cross timbers um, and you think about the different areas where these cattle would raise, or would graze rather, um, you didn't have to uh, have that land um, cleared. And so the female slaves were an investment in the future. Um, they could reproduce, and they could also do basically anything a man could do unless it involved a tremendous amount of strength. And you will see the female slaves out there working the cattle. You'll see the children who were three and five years old uh, with the sheep or helping bring the cows in. They were trained at a very young age uh, to be involved in this industry, um, which will help that transition period after the war. Um, but the value of slavery um, and the difference in the lives of those small slave owners versus the large slave owners is a is an area that needs more study, as do the air, the times the cattle drives to California beforehand. But um, the the connection to slavery is is enormous, um, or to livestock is enormous, and it is a different a different lifestyle um, than plantation slavery. All right, thank you. Thank you.